Let's dig into why the expression in the previous clip was called the generator and why the word infinitesimal uh, somehow shows up. Um, we're going to start off with um, a continuous time Markov chain, unless otherwise mentioned, you're always going to assume that it's time homogeneous. Um, just a warning, this is going to be a little bit theory uh, heavy, but hopefully it's all uh, worthwhile. Let me try to give uh, my best uh, kind of explanation of what's going on. But we're going to start off um, for a second with a function f. You can think of your, your favorite one, maybe the identity function is easiest to, to think about. And uh, because f is a stochastic process, so is f of x, and I'm going to call that uh, y. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be tracking uh, the position or the location of this process y over time. And we're going to do this with this function. Like I mentioned, we're going to look for the process in expectation. So this is the expected value of the process y at some time t down the road, uh, given that the chain started in, um, in x. So when the chain x starts in x, that means y starts in f of x. And again, if it's useful, think of f as being the identity function, in which case y is equal to x. But uh, nevertheless, this just gives you a little bit of flexibility in terms of defining your, uh, um, your uh, kind of any, any stochastic uh, process. Maybe, f, maybe x is sort of some underlying physical phenomena, and f is your model for some particular behavior that you want to study. Um, that said, what we're trying to uh, study here is the evolution of the expected value, so u of xh for small uh, h. So we're trying to see where is y uh, going to be, what's our best prediction of where it's going to be in a small interval of time uh, h. Uh, there's a handy way of doing this, uh, pretty much universal way of doing this, which is Taylor's theorem. You want to expand the function around some value given that uh, the argument of that function hasn't changed by much. Uh, that's going to be h. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to expand uh, using Taylor's theorem, a u of xh around zero. So around the point u of x zero, which is f of x. Um, so if x, big x, I mean, starts in little x, then y, which is f of x, starts in uh, f little x. So this term here in the Taylor expansion is really the usual u of x of zero, the function at zero, and that's equal to f of x, uh, which gives me this leading term in the expansion. I'm going to ignore all terms of order squared. So h is small. So let's ignore uh, things of order h squared. They're way, way too small. And now we're going to have to try to unpack this term. So this derivative of u uh, evaluated at zero is going to give me the kind of an update to where the expected uh, location of y uh, is. So um, what I've done here to, make, to kind of take a stab at this is to write down the definition of a derivative. Um, so all the derivative is, is the difference between uh, the two values uh, over the time interval and h goes down to zero. So this is the derivative at zero. That's why I'm taking a limit uh, to go down uh, to zero. So let's see. Uh, um, our goal here is to get a handle on this derivative and we're going to start by first ignoring this limit and just focusing on this ratio here. Okay. Uh, so far in this ratio, you can see that I've taken my second term and called it uh, f of x. And I didn't just call it that. It literally is f of x. u of x zero is f of x. We've already seen this. And so from the previous slide to this one, the only thing I've done is taken this uh, numerator there and replaced u x zero with f of x. So, so far, so good. Uh, I've dealt with this term here, um, uh, meaning that we know what it is. Let's now look at this one right here, uxh. Uh, uxh is an expectation. So uh, as, any, as the case for any expectation, it can be evaluated against the probability distribution uh, multiplied by the value of the specific random variable that we're taking the expectation of, that's f of xt. And uh, what's the value of f of x t? Well, when x is in, is in state y, that's going to be f of y. And what's the probability of transitioning from x to y in h units of time? Well, you know, we're going to call it uh, p of x, y, h. x is a continuous time Markov chain, a homogeneous one at that. And so it has these 
homogeneous transition probabilities specified for all pairs of states at all times t. And uh, since we're looking at time little h, we're going to uh, stick that in there. So uh, this second step here is by definition. And now I'm going to uh, do a bunch of algebra to try to get a handle on uh, this quantity here and then take the limit as h goes to 0. So let's look at, at how we do this. First term first, this here is my substitution for the definition of uxh from step 2 from right here. So I've just copied uh, that definition. The second term maybe looks a little bit tricky, but you can see how this sum is just equal to 1. So I haven't really done anything. I've left it as f of x as it was. And the reason it's 1 is because um, the process has to transition somewhere. So you have a transition probability. Therefore, if you sum up over all possible outcomes, uh, it's 1. Right? Probability is 1 that the process has to end up somewhere in h units of time. So you know this is a bit of kind of a manipulation and, and, and trickery. But the reason is so that we can take the sum out. And once we take a sum up, we have a much simpler expression on our hands in terms of a difference between f of y and f of x. So this is kind of like um, how much has the state changed um, times the transition probability divided by h. The next step is a little bit, uh, a little bit tricky. Um, it looks, at first glance, it looks wrong because uh, I've kind of just... Um, you know, took liberty and added this term, right? You can see how this term just all of a sudden pops up here as if, as if we can just add it. Um, and it turns out you can, so let, let's try to make that argument. When y is equal to x, <clears throat> uh, f of y is equal uh, to f of x, and therefore this term is zero. Therefore, the thing in the parentheses next to it uh, can be replaced by anything. So I could have put a million there, I could have put the number six, I could have put the number 16, uh, anything could have gone there. So the fact that I've made a modification there by adding this term pxy of zero is kind of like it's, you know, questionable, but it, it's not wrong, uh, right? Mathematically, <laughs> this equal sign continues to hold, even though it, it looks like uh, I'm doing something strange there, but you know, you'll, you'll see the, the purpose. Um, yeah, so that takes care of one value, y equals x. <laughs> when x does not equal to y, which is a, you know, kind of what, what usually is going to happen, um, pxy of 0 is actually 0. And in that case, I haven't done anything at all. Um, so I haven't changed the formula at all. Therefore, this equal sign again holds. Uh, why is this true? Why is pxy of 0 equal to 0? Uh, the reason um, is that uh, if you give the process uh, no opportunity, uh, no time, it has no opportunity to move anywhere. And so you can't expect that in zero time units to go from x to a y when x and y are not the same. Um, uh, and by the way, um, px uh, y of zero when x is equal to y is not surprisingly one. Right? In, in zero time units, with probability one, you stay at the place uh, you, were, you were in. Uh, in any case, we, we now have a you know formula for uh, for this expression here. So we're you know the goal again was to get at the derivative of u. We now look like we have a handle on it in terms of the derivative of the transition probabilities of x. Uh, here I've just taken the um, I've taken h to zero. Uh, the reason for this is of course due to this formula for the derivative, I need to take h down to 0, which I do, and giving me this expression. Okay, so now let's see where we are after all this algebra. Um, this is just a rehash of the previous slide with a question that says, well, what's the point? Um, and the point is that we're trying to track down uh, this expected evolution of the process f of x, and we started out doing so by expanding uh, the, its expected position in h units of time uh, using a Taylor's formula, ignoring all second order terms and focusing in on this derivative, which is going to tell us where the process is going to be. And now we're in a position where we can actually substitute what that derivative is. And I've done so uh, with one little replacement with a little notation, replacing this derivative here by uh, 
we get a Rx. This is just a matter of notation, right? I just let Rxy equal to that derivative. And, uh, and now I have a formula. And so the, um, you know, why is this called the generator? Uh, right? As I say here, the, the generator determines the expected evolution of, it should really be f of x, in a small uh, interval of, of time. You can see how that's the case. We now have a pretty good prediction or pretty good approximation for u of x h in terms of the starting position, right? the starting position of y was f of x. And this term is now telling us how we update that position uh, to account for the fact that uh, a little interval of h time has passed by. And you can see how this quantity here is really the key quantity that's telling us how to update this. Everything else is up to the function f, which you know is fine. It obviously is going to play a role. Uh, this difference here is basically saying um, how much of a jump there was between the states x and y. Uh, but uh, rxy, the generator, is going to be generating the update to our location. In other words, uh, the process y equal to f of x was at location f of x. We've let time go for h time units. And we see that the derivative of the transition probabilities, what we call now we're going to call the generator, uh, is responsible for updating that position. Uh, the reason for the word infinitesimal should also be somewhat clear. Uh, we've taken an infinitesimal uh, unit uh, of, uh, of time length. Um, so h was very, very close to zero. And you know, the closer to zero you are uh, due to the, these errors, um, uh, the, the more accurate this update is. And so uh, Rxy is in a way generating the path of, of the expected path of this process y equals f of x on very small or infinitesimal length uh, time scales. So uh, that gives you a little bit of a sense about why uh, this quantity got the name generator and why the word infinitesimal is uh, often uh, prepended uh, to it. Uh, there is one special thing about the generator, um, and this comes back to my, the question I raised about, uh, you know, is there an analog of one-step transition probabilities that, that we had in the discrete time context? And the generator turns out to be that, that thing. Um, the generator is going to encode all of these probabilities for us. So let me back up a little bit. So the generator, I'm going to say this again, the generator is going to encode all of these probabilities, um, and there are a lot of them. So for all time and for all pairs of states, we are, uh, you know, we, we have these probabilities that define our continuous time Markov chain. And we're looking for something that's a little bit more like the one step transition probability, namely something that uh, is just there for all pairs of states. So we don't have to keep track of infinitely many things, which we're doing uh, by, uh, by keeping this. By, you know, with this uh, transition probability. Um, uh, and so uh, th this generator is in fact gonna, uh, gonna encode or contain all of this information. So all the information can in contained here is in fact gonna be summarized in the generator, um, hence its importance. Here's how uh, I'm gonna try to convince you of this. If you remember in the discrete time Markov chain uh, context, um, we had these uh, chaplin kolmogorov equations, which uh, were about uh, describing a trip that a Markov chain took from some location to some other location in some amount of time. The same equation is possible to state in the continuous time setting. In fact, the proof is essentially identical. Uh, and the intuition for this formula is also uh, the same. Uh, the formula is very intuitive. Let's look at the left-hand side probability of going from x to y in time t is the same thing as splitting up this trip into two parts. The first part of the trip is going to be from x to some stop z. So we're going to just make a stop somewhere and that state or that stop is going to be called z. We're going to take s units of time to do it. s is smaller than the time of the trip, right? You can't stop somewhere in the future. You can only stop somewhere during the trip. So s is less than or equal to, to t. Um, 
And, uh, and now, once we've made this stop, we have the remainder of the trip to finish. That's what this probability is about. It's saying that, you know, we had a probability of going from X to the stop Z in time S. Let's finish the trip. The remaining time in the trip is T minus S. The, um, uh, you know, we have to get to from, from Z, where we stopped, to the final destination, which is Y. And of course, I'm going to sum over all Z because this, the stop, you know, I have to account for all possible stops. Otherwise, I haven't added up all my probabilities accurately. Um, so that's the, you know, that's uh, kind of, you know, when we had S and T be discrete um, in the discrete um, time Markov chain setting, and these were called the chapman kolmogorov gorov equations. That's why I've labeled them CK here. Uh, here's what gets a, a little bit um, interesting and, and starts to involve the, the generator. Uh, this is a quick note that uh, of how to prove this. It's just conditioning on the stop, right? So if you start with the left-hand side here <clears throat> and condition that formula uh, by applying the tower property of conditional expectation, if you condition on excess, uh, you'll get uh, this right-hand side there almost immediately. It's a good, good exercise. But uh, let's keep going. We're, what we're going to do is we're going to take the derivative of both sides of these equations. So I'm going to take the derivative of the left-hand side here. There it is. You can see how the derivative, you know, kind of goes through this sum and it uh, has to get, you know, it, it gets to operate on this term. Uh, this term here, PXZS, may be skipped because uh, that doesn't depend on T. And so the derivative just kind of swipes in and uh, tries to operate on, on this term, PZY T minus Z. And the next uh, thing I'm going to do is because this formula holds for all S less than or equal to, uh, to T, um, uh, I'm going to just take a limit as S goes up to T, uh, giving me the following equation. Okay, so what I've done here is I've taken S to T, which takes this little interval of time and shrinks it down to zero, which explains me taking the derivative at H and setting H to zero. And it also explains why all of a sudden, instead of S, I have T here because um, I've taken H to zero. That means I've taken the difference between S and T down to zero. So S goes up to, to T, uh, giving me this value XZ of T. And then finally, we recognize that the, uh, the right-hand side contains the generator. And what you have is now uh, this simplified equation, which we're going to look at now. These are now called the chapman kolmogorov equations for a homogeneous continuous time Markov chain X with infinitesimal generator R. So it's a, a handful uh, of words. But uh, you know what it's uh, telling you is that the generator defines a system of ordinary differential equations. And when solved, these equations will give you the transition probabilities for the process. It, the kind of the punchline here is that you don't have to keep all of these transition probabilities. So, you know, this is infinitely many things because you have to keep them for an infinitely many uh, times. You don't need uh, this many things. Uh, what you need is the generator. What you do with the generator is you plug them into this ODE and you have an initial condition. You can see what that is. What's the initial condition? Uh, it's that at time zero, if X is equal to Y, uh, that uh, probability is, uh, is one, right? In zero time, you have to stay at X. And then when X does not equal to, uh, to Y in zero time units, you couldn't have moved anywhere else. So it's zero. That's what this indicator is. This indicator is one when X is equal to Y and it's zero otherwise. So this is the initial condition. These are the uh, ODEs, the ordinary differential equations. You solve them. And uh, what it's telling you here is that all you need is the generator. Once you have the generator, you have all of these transition probabilities. And so no need to kind of uh, keep them, uh, no need to use uh, this. So, you know, the summary again is the generator encodes the entire set of transition probabilities and coming back to kind of our original question, is there something analogous to one step transition probabilities that we had in, um, 
in in uh, in discrete time, this is going to be it. The, the generator is a very simple uh, you know object. It's just a, a bunch of numbers for each pairs of states. In a way, it's it's a matrix, right? For a finite uh, number of states, it's it's actually a matrix, um, and that's all you need to know uh, to define your continuous time Markov chain. So a continuous time Markov chain is uh, can be completely described by its generator, right? And very much like a one-step transition probability, it's just a matrix of numbers, uh, one number for every single pair of states. Okay.